Okay, so what is Slack? Slack is a messaging app to connect businesses to the information that they need. You can use it with your colleagues, you can use it with your friends, yourself. For me, it's become like a personal notepad. Essentially, they are on a mission to transform the way that people communicate within an organization. Slack was founded here in Vancouver, British Columbia in Canada, where I live in 2013 by Stuart Butterfield and Cal Henderson. So how did Slack get started? Well, Slack was originally developed to solve a problem for game developers. In 2011, a startup called Tiny Spec was working on building an online multiplayer game called Glitch that you see here. The team behind Tiny Spec and Glitch had already seen success building and selling companies, one of those being Flickr, which was one of the largest photo sharing apps in the Web 2.0 era. When the team launched Glitched, they launched a beta version with Fanfare, which is an automated testing software. And out of the gate, they raised 17 million from investors and built a team of 45 people to start building out this product. The characters and the background and the art and glitch were described to look like Monty Python crossed with acid, crossed with Dr. Seuss. So what's, what's the ambition? The ambition is that um, the game ultimately becomes about uh, people creating culture. It sounds a little bit weird because it's not totally free from us. It's not uh, completely user generated. The art's coming from us. Um, mm -hmm. But people have a lot of power to rearrange and recombine things, and there are already a number of, and there'll be more societal level mechanics, so people can create groups which can be modeled like a cult or a religion or a corporation or whatever. I mean, obviously, it's a mostly very tongue in cheek. Um, but from that, they develop a culture and decide how to expand the world, kind of grow it, what parts of it to support, what parts of it to let go. Now, the initial reviews of Glitch were not great. I didn't play the game, this is just what I read. The CEO, Stuart Butterfield, said that 97% of people who signed up left within five minutes. And as a multiplayer game, Glitch would really only be fun if you had your friends playing with you, tapping into what we like to call network effects. Four years later, with all the funding spent and employees laid off, Tiny Spec relaunched with a new product that we all know and love called Slack. You're probably wondering how the heck they got from Glitch to Slack. To help the Glitch team work together in person and remote, the team built a chat tool to communicate with each other. It was just text and it wasn't very pretty. They built this tool on top of IRC, which was called Internet Relay Chat and was first created in 1988, but it wasn't very usable for non-developers. Hence the reason that the team built this chat functionality on top of IRC. Hack on hack on hack on top of IRC. So first logging the messages, then searching them, there's no good iPhone clients. This is, there might be now, I don't know. Back in 2009, 2010, there wasn't. So we built an HTML5 front end so we could use a mobile Safari to read the archives, but then we needed to be able to post from there too, so we built posting, and then we wanted announcements when someone uploaded something to the file server. And then database alerts and daily stats getting pumped in, and you know, over the years, just all these kind of features accrued on top of it. When the team realized that unfortunately Glitch was not going to be a success, they turned to this chat tool, and they called it many things like Franken Tool, Line Feed, Honeycomb, Charlie.io, and other names. But when the team started building features that we all know and love about Slack today, like searching, photo sharing, and backed up conversations, they landed on Slack, which stands for Searchable Log of All Conversations and Knowledge. Now, I do want to touch on the fact that it wasn't like the Glitch team was sitting around thinking that they had discovered the next product that was going to revolutionize the way people communicate in the workplace. It was kind of quite the opposite. They built the tool for themselves and they liked using it, and it was only when they started to give up on Glitch and think about new ideas that they realized that they would never leave this messaging chat system that they built behind, that their team communicated so much more efficiently because of it, and hey, maybe other teams would benefit from it as well. When we decided to shut down the game, that was in uh, November of 2012, we realized that none of us would ever work without a system like this again, but this was kind of a hacky prototype. They also had a bit of a hard time communicating to early investors and friends and family what the value props of Slack were. This is because it came so natural to them. It was obvious why you would use something like Slack but they had to take a minute and refine those value props in a way that would resonate and make sense to a first-time user. 
And this is where they spoke to their idea of channels. So let's call our channel customer success. Within that channel, I'm talking about all things customer success. I'm sharing photos and files and resources and feedback, and I'm inviting everybody on the customer success team. And when someone new joins our team, I'm inviting them to that channel, and they can view all of the resources and information and communication conversation that's happened there in the past. Now, when you join Gmail, you get your email and an empty inbox. There is no way for you to access all the previous conversations and all the content that might have come with them. You also, most of the time, are getting emails sent just to you. If you want to be looped into other things, you have to be cc'd, you have to be asked to get the email forwarded to you. The information in the conversation is just not as accessible. When Slack first launched, it was reviewed by friends and family, and Stuart, the CEO, said that he actually handled most of the customer support inquiries, which is something you'll hear often from founder stories because it's a great way to catch initial customer feedback, catch bugs, and make sure that you're iterating on your product fast enough to give users what they want and need. They said that they made customer feedback the focus of all of their efforts in the early stages. Uh, that the role of designer is that of a good host. That way of thinking that you know the people using your product are your guests is puts you in a very different mindset than you're like this creative genius and what you're doing is super important and the world just doesn't understand you um, and people should appreciate this. Because we have really just uh, 180 degree different attitude when we evaluate our own stuff versus when we use other people's software or experience other people's products. And it's like this thing where when you go to a restaurant website, if you're anything like me, you want the phone number, the address, the opening times, or the menu, and nothing else matters. And yet no one makes restaurant websites that prioritize that stuff. It's like this stupid music starts playing and there's like a slow Ken Burns pan over some pasta or whatever, and you have to wait for that to be done. No one wants that experience for themselves, and yet they feel like other people are gonna want it. Um, and that's a kind of the most exaggerated example I can find, but we really try to put ourselves in the position of our customers and you can try different techniques for that. One that I'm, I'm not sure if it's truly effective or not, but I tried a lot with people, is just to try to imagine someone's heard about Slack a couple times, maybe they saw a tweet about it, um, they saw an ad that we put up, and then someone recommended again. It's the end of their day, it's 9 p.m., they just put the kids to bed, they're watching TV, they lay back, they go to the app store and they install our app, and we are just like, not even in the top 1,000 most important things in their lives. You know, like they have all these other concerns, ambitions, issues, and we don't want to um, create an experience that is anything less than the most respectful it could be. The goal was to use Slack as a group. The minimum number to define a group was three, but the larger the better. Slack sort of created this new style of bottom-up growth where individual contributors were responsible for seeding product adoption within the company. And to do this, they said they made it a focus to create resources and materials for those individual contributors to communicate to their managers or their teams why Slack was great to use. Slack started to figure out what their magic number was or what some of their metrics were for measuring retention. And what they found was that teams that exchanged 2,000 messages we're 93% more likely to stay using Slack for the foreseeable future. By 2016, Slack was reportedly being used by 77% of Fortune 100 companies. The period between 2016 and 2020 was a defining moment in the history of Slack. Slack added more features, including threaded messaging and Slack Connect. The company also launched 50 plus integrations as part of its ever-growing developers-inspired app directory. In June of 2019, Slack finally went public with its DPO, a non-conventional IPO, the Butterfield-led company was now valued at $19 billion. Given that Slack virtually had no competition early on in the collaboration tools market, big league legacy companies saw the opportunity to take advantage of Slack's success. These companies had prior experience running IM programs in the 1990s and 2000s, so they were able to enter the market relatively quickly. Facebook, now Meta, launched Workplace in October of 2016. Microsoft launched Teams in March of 2017, and finally came Google with Workspace in October of 2020. Out of all three, it's Microsoft Teams that has truly been able to give Slack a run for its money. For our large enterprise customers, 
almost 100% of them are Microsoft customers. Of those, almost 100% of Office 365, and of those, almost all have Teams. Um, and we just coexist alongside. And the, our success in, at the large, you know, the high end of the, of the um, market, it's like seven of the top 10 telcos in the world, five of the five big retailers in the US, the largest issue of credit cards or in financial services, healthcare, manufacturing. I mean, obviously media and technology, because that's you know where we, where we got started. People just use Slack and Teams uh, alongside one another in the same way that we at, at Slack, the company, use Slack and Zoom. They use Teams for voice and video calling and they use Slack as their digital HQ. And to wrap up this story time on a high note, Salesforce bought Slack for billions of dollars in 2021, making it its largest acquisition to date. Slack is one of the fastest growing apps in the world. If you hate email as much as me, sorry, go ahead and check it out. Uh, I think Slack, um, joining forces with Salesforce is uh, going to completely transform uh, this part of the industry around the future of work and productivity software. Um, and uh, I think what Slack really brings Salesforce is this modern uh, uh, operating system for knowledge work where you can connect the front office, the back office, your customers, their partners, and have a common interface to be able to communicate and collaborate across all those different experiences. Uh over the next 12 to 18 months, now that you're part of uh, Salesforce, the interface on Slack might look a little different. What are you guys working on there? Well, there's a couple of things. So um, uh, one track at Frontiers this year, we're announcing like a completely re-engineered version of the platform. And the Slack platform has been hugely successful. There's a million plus active developers. There's just about a million um, custom integrations are created by customers that are in active use. So it's an it's a incredibly um, powerful platform that has a huge amount of activity, and yet we put all of this friction in front of it, so we're making it a lot easier to give people building blocks and to recombine things, and in a world where more and more people are using more and more software all the time, that interoperability and that kind of lightweight fabric for systems integration is, is really powerful. On the other hand, um, we launched Huddles uh, in July, and it's, a, it's like an audio-only calling alternative because it's not a call. It doesn't start and stop, and people can join and leave at different times. Um, it, it's already being used by millions and millions of people. It's over a third of our, um, our users are, are active on it weekly. Uh, and Clips, video sharing for asynchronous meeting alternatives, and all that stuff is like is brand new in response to what we learned from ourselves and from customers during the pandemic. If you love using Slack or you found this story interesting or inspiring, go check out their careers page. They're hiring in the customer success area, interns, product and tech, and sales. I hope you found this video valuable. Let me know in the comments if there is a company you'd like to dive into next time, and thank you for listening.